Um, today, uh, we're going to be talking about the Wally Walton Dawn Show, uh, or just live from outer space at this point in time. So, in the Wally Walton Dawn Show, will make a little more sense for those of you who may not know what I'm talking about as we go through the lecture. Uh, we are entering the 50th anniversaries of the Apollo era. Uh, so it, it, it is that season, and it's going to be all the way through 2012. Um, and realistically, if you think about it, because Apollo continued with the Skylab program and also with Apollo Soyuz, um, we're going to be going on even further um, when we talk about a, or excuse, 2022. Sorry, yeah. So, so I need to drink more of that coffee. Um, uh, in any case, though, so... Yeah, there you go. So that was that was your check this morning, you know, just to make sure all of you are awake. Yeah, so sorry about that. Um, I only wish it was 2012, I think, to that point, you know, so um, uh, in any case, though, I always start off with with a quote. So the important achievement of Apollo was demonstrating that humanity is not forever chained to our planet and our visions go rather further than that. And our opportunities are unlimited. OK, so we're going to be talking about these things eventually and going to the moon. But that's not today, because that's a Saturn V rocket. And on Apollo 7, we didn't fly on the Saturn V. We flew on, flew on something a little bit smaller. Um, but this was really the, the, what they were testing during this mission was the command and service module. It was a flight test. It was a flight check of the command and service module that was going to keep the astronauts alive, the newest spacecraft. We'd flown Mercury. We'd flown Gemini. Now we were going to be flying Apollo. So uh, whereas Mercury and Gemini were built by Lockheed, um, this one, or McDonnell Douglas, excuse me, Lockheed. <laughs> Boy, I'm not having a good morning. So in any case, though, Apollo was built by North American, and this is the North American plant there in Downey, California. Before you have Apollo 7, you have Apollo 1. Um, and probably the successes of Apollo directly are related back to Apollo 1. So AS204, there's a whole bunch of designators. And if you really want to get into something weird, you could probably spend a lot of time. We could do a whole lecture on how NASA named and numbered their spacecraft and the kind of the weird anomalies and screw ups kind of thing during the Apollo program as they were getting it going and then the decisions to go back and change things and spacecraft showing up with another name on the spacecraft, et cetera, et cetera. There's all sorts of stuff. It goes back, and it's named Apollo 1 really afterwards, but it's really AS-204, and we lose Grissom, White, and Ch Chaffee um, during that pad um, test uh, when there's the fire in the capsule. In any case, the, the, what was being flown at this point in time was what was called the Block 1 capsules. These were not the capsules that were going to go to the moon. These were the shorter duration capsules. This was the initial um, set that, uh, that uh, um, Rockwell was building, um, and these were for low Earth orbit for testing out systems, et cetera, of the service module and the command module. So it was the block, block one. So uh, here's another picture of it. So we're going to go through some of this. But at that point in time, as you were doing, you had backup crews. You had crews tra training for the next missions, et cetera. Eventually, these crews were going to become the next Apollo missions. But the key thing is, is that the backup crew for Apollo 1 were these folks here. Um, a little bit of a disclaimer on that one. We lose Ed White on board Apollo 1, but he wasn't supposed to fly on Apollo 1. Actually, it was supposed to be Don Isley, um, who was supposed to be flying on that mission. And he's actually on the Apollo 7 crew. He dislocated his shoulder. And so they flip-flopped the two guys on the missions. And uh, Ed uh, ends up passing away along with the other astronauts on Apollo 1. And Don Isley flies on Apollo 7. So just a little bit about that one. These three fly. Uh, I'm going to kind of move along here, fire. With the loss. The block ones were only used for the unmanned tests. Different pressures that were utilized in the cabins. The, the spacesuits, when they went to the block two capsules, they replaced it with beta cloth. A lot of things I'm talking about that were learned in Apollo 1 that were then you know, um, applied into um, the block two capsules. And that matters because we end up flying a block two capsule um, with Apollo 7. They redesigned the hatch so that instead of it taking forever to open, and that was part of the problem with Apollo 1 and the fire. You can open it within five seconds. Flammable materials in place limited. The plumbing and wiring were f jiggered and fixed and, and covered, et cetera. So a lot of changes made to it. So Wally Shira said, after the Apollo 1 crew was lost, we said that we wore black armband for a few weeks, and we wear it in our hearts for forever. The description around NASA was that Wally changed after the Apollo 1 fire. OK, here's the backup commander. They had been in that capsule doing the same test, the guys who fly on Apollo 7, before the Apollo 1 crew. 
and then the Apollo 1 crew gets in there, the fire occurs, and they all die. Wally is now assigned to fly the, the first Apollo mission, he and his crew. Um, the numbers get rejiggered, as I said, it becomes Apollo 7, because there's other flight, type, flight tests in the medium. It's 22 months between Apollo 1 and when we fly on Apollo 7. So instead of, what they were going to do is fly a Block 1 flight, low Earth orbit, and then fly another Block 1 flight of the command modules. But because there's such an interim, because there's so many changes made, they just move straight in. They're going to fly a Block 2 capsule on, uh, uh, on the, uh, or excuse me, they're going to fly the Block 1, but then all the subsequent missions are going to be the Block 2 capsules um, uh, after that. In any case, the, uh, 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 the patch here uh, shows the spacecraft in low, low Earth orbit. One of the things you see the most is the service propulsion system engine right here firing. That was one of the big things that they were testing because this engine was going to need to fire repeatedly during the mission, and that was one of the things that they were testing with their names. Okay, by the numbers, 10 days, 20 hours, 9 minutes that it's up in orbit. It launches on October 11th, 50 years ago, so right around now. 163, oh, by the way, 10 days, 20 hours, 9 minutes. Longer than, at that point in time, longer than all of the Soviet flights combined. So a little bit of a leap at this point in time, you know, and, and when you're thinking about the space race going on. 4,546,918 miles. It landed in the Atlantic Ocean, not too far from Bermuda. Um, landed just a couple of kilometers away from the uh, recovery ship. USS Essex was used for recovery. It launched from Launch Complex 34, not at the Space Center, um, where we launched all the other Apollo flights from, but over on the Air Force Station. So, and it was launched with a Saturn 1B, and it was designated AS Apollo Saturn 205. So here's the crew getting ready to go. So this was on the day, you can see that little wire up there. They were, do, they were doing escape tower testing, um, uh, the, the, the slide wire that they had to, for the crew to get away from the launch tower if there was a fire or emergency. And so uh, after they did the testing, they just had the crew pose uh, kind of in the, uh, in the starting position, shall we say. Here's our crew, uh, Don Isley right here, Wally Shira, Walt Cunningham. Here they are in their white scarf pose. Aviators, that's all I'm saying. So in any case, or you know, for the Air Force folks out there, pilots. So um, uh, in any case, uh, all kind of the same breed. So that's kind of the joke between submariners and aviators and surface guys and aviators and things and various and certain services. Interestingly enough, I put this picture up, same thing. They're in the same outfits. It was taken at the same time. Notice this capsule back here. Sue, does it look familiar? Yeah, we have this capsule. So it's in our, it's in our support building. Um, on the other side of town, and it was in display, on display in the front of the museum for quite a while as well. Okay, Wally Shira, uh, the commander of our mission. Just going to talk a little bit about each of the various and assorted astronauts. Wally ends up being the only astronaut to fly in Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. He was one of the original Mercury 7 astronauts. So here they are, kind of in one of those very early photos um, uh, of, of all of them before, uh, before they get going. Wally's, Wally's right up here. Um, Wally was known as a little bit of a jokester, so here's the wives of the astronauts. I always love putting this one in, you know, in just in connection with the, uh, with the previous photo. They did not know what they were getting themselves into. So in any case, uh, Wally was, you see, he's got kind of a smile on his face here. Wally was kind of known as the jolly, jolly Wally, okay, the jokester of the group. Uh, he was responsible for a lot of the gotchas uh, and thing, and that, the jokes going back and forth between the astronauts the ground control people, everything. You know, it was just, it's one of those things, it's still done to this day, you know, in the military. It's just one of those things. In fact, in all services, but he was known as one of the bigger jokesters. Did a lot of stuff. I mean, he, he, the, the five gallon jug of urine, you know, left for the astronaut nurse wasn't really urine, obviously. So, um, but, you know, just a numerous different jokes, you know, whether it was sending food into space, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, like I said, remember when Apollo 1 occurs, that's when they noted a significant change in Wally's demeanor and attitude. He became much more focused. Now, just because he was a prankster, because he liked to have fun, does not mean that the man was not focused. In fact, test pilot, when he was doing tests, absolutely one of the most focused uh, of the astronauts. And his flights, both his Mercury flight and his Gemini flight, were known for his outstanding execution uh, of those missions and absolutely accomplishing everything uh, in rapid order that was supposed to occur on those. So, yeah, like I said, a little bit of a jokester. So, <laughs> a 
not often seen without a smile. This is on his Gemini mission. I always like to show that one. There's the beat army. He had three Navy guys and one Army guy on the two flights that rendezvoused between Gemini 6 and Gemini 7. So they had to get their digs in. Um, I'm going to skip past this one. So you got Walt Cunningham. So you had, you, you had three individuals on this flight. It was the first time we flew with three people. You had a commander. No surprise. You had a command module pilot. So another person who would be, quote, unquote, flying the command module. And then you had, well, we didn't have a lunar module flying on the mission. So, but you had to have that third person. So you did have a lunar module pilot, um, but you actually didn't have a lunar module. So in any case, uh, we were still flying with three to test out everything about the command service module, just like we'd be going up. Walt Cunningham uh, and then Don Isley. Um, uh, Walt was uh, Marine and Don Isley was Air Force. He graduated from the Naval Academy, similar to, uh, uh, to Wally Shira as well. Take a couple extra pictures of him. Don Isley and Walt Cunningham came from the third group of astronauts. Okay, one of the you know decorated crews of astro uh, groups of astronauts, and also the one that had the highest casualty rate um, uh, of, with loss of life due to either aircraft or the spacecraft accident as well. But you've got luminaries in there: Dave Scott, Gene Cernan, Al Bean, Buzz Aldrin, Mike Collins, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a number of number of individuals whose names are fairly well known if you know anything about Apollo. So as they're getting ready for the mission, it's not just the crew training for the mission. It's preparing the spacecraft, learning, you know, getting used to um, the, the people being inside of a cr uh, spacecraft of this size, three of them for a long period of time. So they did testing even to the point of putting um, so, oops, some Air Force pilots, excuse me, some Air Force pilots into a capsule, having them in there for a couple of weeks, living here on Earth. Um, for a long duration test, and here you can see the 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 three uh, uh, excuse me uh, the three uh, Air Force pilots after they'd come out of the test, and everything was run just like they were on a real mission, doing the testing, doing the same sleeping, uh, eating, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you're you're kind of assembling, putting together the uh, the actual capsule uh, and the spacecraft itself as it gets assembled. Here's the uh, uh, here's the Apollo 7 capsule getting put together on the spacecraft. There's the, so when I talk about a service module, if you didn't know what I'm speaking of, it's that section of the spacecraft right here. It's where essentially all of your fuel, all of your air, water, power, you know, so it's the engine um, of the spacecraft. And then here's where the astronauts obviously are. So vibration testing. Um, this is the vibration test that they did uh, on one of the capsules. This capsule is actually now on display at the National Air and Space Museum. And Gordo Cooper was in here with literally a couple of mannequins um, uh, when they did the vibration test on the uh, on the uh, space capsule here um, for uh, prior to the mission. So you've got the crew training, uh, and in the background you can see actually the lunar module trainer back there. They're actually getting ready for the mission on board. Uh, uh, the, the training is occurring for that at the same time. Water egress training. I love the sunglasses here. Love those. Um, uh, so in, in any case, though, out in the ocean they would take the capsule out there, and you'll see that in one of the other pictures. You do it in the pool as well. Um, and you, We always talk about boilerplate capsules, like the boilerplate capsule out in front of the museum. Um, that was utilized for recovery and crane operations and aircraft coming along and, and uh, searching for it, et cetera. You have other, uh, other capsules that, you know, they really don't have the entire interior, but they have enough for the astronauts to be able to get inside, get in the seats, unbuckle, get out, test their water egress skills, et cetera. Different types of boilerplates, same size, same shape, all built by North America. Well, actually not all. A few of them were also built down near Johnson Space Center, but most built at North American uh, Rockwell. Here they are out on the, uh, uh, the motor vessel, getting ready to do the water egress training, not just in the blue suits, also in their space suits, just in case something happened and they had to do a water recovery uh, like during launch um, uh, when they were going up, et cetera. And they were still in, <coughs> in the suits and had to get out of it quickly. Here they are actually out at sea and you can kind of see the crane system that would lower and raise the ship or the spacecraft. Remember I mentioned the uh, slide wire. So here's one of the astronauts on the slide wire um, that would come down from, from the actual spacecraft up on the launch pad. Um, they could hook onto it, just think of zip wire. It's really what it is, you know, get away from the spacecraft, jump down from there, hop into a tracked vehicle and right away. So, and try and get away from the big gigantic bomb that is essentially a rocket on the launch pad. So here's the spacecraft, uh, the, or as I should say, the uh, rocket um, system being uh, assembled. 
You'll notice it's the Saturn 1B, not the Saturn 5, smaller rocket. Still the biggest rocket that we're launching at this point in time with people on board. More of the assembly process of the different stages being added on, second stage, third stage, et cetera. There's Gordo Cooper coming out after they did that, uh, um, uh, that vibration test. So a lot of preps. One of the other things, okay, I said Wally's demeanor changed. Now we're going to kind of get into the mission, the mission itself. So uh, Wally spent a lot of time, and the crew did, obviously, at North American, um, looking over the shoulders of the, of the team that was building the spacecraft. Uh, really watching it closely because that's where a lot of the a lot of the errors that occurred in design, testing, um, the spacecraft assembly, the spacecraft design. You know, there was there was errors abounding, and everybody had a had a had a piece in that in the loss of the Apollo One uh, crew. In any case, though, Wally was going to make sure that that didn't happen, and so it was not uncommon to have him in the factory, literally there looking over as the engineers were working on design, as the, as the workers there were working on assembly, as you know, each of these things was occurring, he was looking over it. One of the things that, yeah? Yes. The vertical assembly building was used for the flights, the, the Saturn V flights. So when you think about the large Saturn V rocket, the, ass the assembly I'm talking about is the, is the capsule itself, you know, in the service module, et cetera. The assembly of putting those pieces together that you saw there, that occurs at the Cape. Downey, California. Yep, so just outside of Los Angeles. So in any case, though, looking over everything, one of the things that he was concerned about was that the, uh, the, the crew... Um, you've got the crew inside the capsule, and then you've got the, the, the group of individuals, that essentially the prep team, that gets the, that's in the white room there that gets them ready to go, the launch crew, and the, uh, the pad team. And so uh, when they had gone from the previous contractor to North American, you now have a different pad team than you'd had for Mercury and Gemini. The guys from Mercury and Gemini were used to Gunter Vent being in charge of the pad team because he had been an employee of, uh, uh, of uh, um, the, the uh, McDonnell Douglas. In any case, though, when they switched to North American, he didn't work for North American, so they had a different pad team. Wally insisted that they bring back Gunter. And even then, when they brought him back, they originally put him on an evening shift. He made him put him onto the day shift because he wanted Gunter in charge of the spacecraft operations at the pad. Gunter ends up getting, no, as, I, as I mentioned, hired by North American, and he stays on all the way through the uh, shuttle program many years on. Uh, and retires well into the shuttle program. But he ends up being in charge of those pad operations and is jokingly called the pad Nazi because he is very strict with what, ha what goes on. And he was, you know, he was of German ancestry. He'd grown up, uh, lived in Germany, fought during World War II on the, on the German side, emigrated to, immigrated to America, uh, and then ended up working in the aerospace industry. So, and uh, is actually inducted into the Hall of Fame here as well. Um, they, and they always did jokes back and forth, but he was very serious when it came to, to operations. One of the funny things here, I said, I wonder where, um, you may have heard the joke, when the guys got into the capsule on launch day and they shut the hatch, um, the, uh, Don Isley, just, sa just when they did that and the pad um, team had left, he just said jokingly, I wonder where Gunther went. <laughs> Gunther went, you know, we'd spell it spelled Gunther went, as we would say in America, but it's pronounced vent. So he said, I wonder where Gunther went. And then the crew got a very big laugh out of that. kind of broke the tension um, uh, of what was going on uh, there at the pad. <coughs> OK, so here's the Saturn 1B on the launch tower. You'll notice it looks a little different than Saturn 5. Big, gigantic, yeah. So um, uh, what's that? It's, yeah, and they call yeah, yeah, milk stool. So is what they called it. So uh, in a, like a milking stool, you know. So in any case, though, much smaller rocket, obviously, than Saturn V, but that capsule up there and that service module are the same size. So in any case, this is going to be used for low Earth orbit. Eventually, we'll use it for the Skylab program. We'll use it for Apollo Soyuz, et cetera. So, uh, but this is what, it, this is what you're gonna, they're going to be launching off of uh, on launch day. So when we get to launch day, um, you can see here the crew always has breakfast together, uh, low residue breakfast. The idea of that is, is that it limits the amount that you're going to need to go to the bathroom kind of stiffens you up, shall we say, um, uh, as well. So uh, uh, in any case, so that's part of the, and the tradition is, is that not only the crew, 
um, but you're going to have the NASA, NASA hierarchy in there. Yes, sir? Did they use diapers? They, they use, I don't think they use diapers at this point in time, no. Do you remember, Dave, if they had anything? Not. They got in. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, as opposed to, like, if you think about a spacewalk where you might be out there for 10 hours or, or something like that, at this point in time, you know, within a very short period of time, they were going to be up. I couldn't remember if they had anything in. Obviously, they had, they had something to take care of, number one, shall we say, okay, while they were in the, you know, in the, in the suits, um, but, but not number two, so, um, unless they were doing a spacewalk. Then they did, so. Uh, in any case, though, you see kind of a go for seven here. Let me see on the next one here. Okay, this is Don Isley, as we'd mentioned before. Um, one of the funny stories coming out of this one is, is that um, the head of NASA, when he was introducing the crew to President Johnson down in Mississippi at the, at the, at the NASA facility down there, he was in, you know, Wally Shira, he'd known Wally for a long time, easy to say his name. Walt Cunningham, fairly simple name to say. Well, Isley's name is E-I-S-E-L-E. -E. Okay, so if you're seeing that and not really paying attention, how do you pronounce it? And people had a little bit of trouble with his last name. And he stumbles along trying to say his name. It ends up kind of something like Issel is what he ends up saying to President Johnson. Wally gets, you know, not at the moment, but afterwards gets a kind of a laugh out of this one and just says, your, your new nickname is what's his name? You know, so... And so that's, yeah, you can see here on the mug, what's his name? So, and the joke was is that it was Wally Walton, what's his name, on the mission. So, in any case, here's the crew, here the crew is. Um, they're getting suited up uh, for the flight. If you look at the guys during the Mercury and Gemini era, they're sitting on those, those, those typical um, uh, military era, you know, Naga hide chairs, you know, the metal chairs kind of thing, you know, getting into the suits. It's a little... Not quite what you see here with the like la with the lazy boy recliners um, uh, that they're in, and actually in the background here, you notice them totally kicked back. Actually, it 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 really does work, you know. So it's helping to relax you, get into the right position. Think about the couch that you're in in the spacecraft. You can get everything adjusted, uh, make sure everything feels good. You're you're in a kind of a similar position, and you're relaxing as because remember they're working on everybody at one time, but not everybody finishes uh, at the same time as they're getting going. Here they are kind of still suiting up. Okay, I'm going to point out something here. Once again, here, here you have Don Isley. You got the Snoopy cap on here that was called. You got his space suit. He hasn't put on his gloves, hasn't put on the helmet yet. Okay, right here, his chin strap, and then you got the communications. You'll notice a slight difference between this and this. <laughs> slight difference. Wally did not like that thought it was uncomfortable. So he had one of the technicians go out and purchase. Anybody got anybody have any idea what that is? What? Who said it? Football helmet. Chin strap. There's the chin strap that he wore. So on on the mission. So he had them go out and buy it, you know, so and then they disconnected it afterwards, et cetera, so and, and and took it off. So, but in any case, that's what he wore on the actual on the actual mission. So, and we have it here in the collection. So it was donated to us. Here they are coming out. Typically, you know, come out of the astronaut the 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 headquarters building there. Get into the uh, transfer van and head out to uh, head out to the launch pad. Get out at the launch pad and start heading out towards the spacecraft. Okay, so they they have climbed into the spacecraft. <coughs> they're up at the top of the milk stool in the in the spacecraft. Um, everybody's left. One of the things that was a concern before the mission was that they were still using the couches from the Block One spacecraft. Okay, remember at Block One, Block Two, they're still using the couches from the Block One spacecraft. Those couches weren't as well designed and as sturdy as the ones for the Block Two, but they weren't quite ready yet. So they were still using the ones from the Block One. There was a concern that if you had a pad abort, so something happened on the launch pad, fire, whatever, some emergency, and the escape system had to pull the spacecraft away. Remember, the escape system is that little tower up at the top there, and you can see it when you look out at the Little Joe 2 out here. And remember, the Little Joe 2s were used here in New Mexico to test the escape system. In any case, though, this would pull the capsule away from the 
whatever was bad was happening, the bad thing going on below it with the rocket, would pull it away from that and parachute down and land the crew. Possibly over the water, possibly over land. It's supposed to pull them out and land them over water, but if there were enough, if there was enough wind blowing towards the shore, it could blow them back on land. The Block 1 capsules, if the, if the capsule hit just kind of the right angle, hit it, the crew could get killed, actually, so, by, the, by that actual uh, impact. Similar to, you know, like race cars these days. You can have a race car, same race car, same harness system, et cetera. One race car, and, and I've seen this, I learned about this in, in EMT school when they showed video of it. Race car hits like this, the, the driver broke a toe. Race car hits like this, the driver died instantly. And it all had to do with the way the harness and the seat system is. Same problem with the Block 1 seats. And they were concerned about that one. If you had over 18 knots of onshore wind, you could get blown back onto land. And Wally said, we don't want that. So he wanted a, a rule on launch day that said, if the winds were blowing onshore over 18 knots, no launch. We don't do anything. Anybody got any idea what the winds were blowing that day? Take a look at those palm trees right there. Okay. They were going between 20 and 25 knots. And they can see it on the spacecraft because the spacecraft actually moves. This building moves when the wind's blowing heavy enough. You can see this building and you can feel it actually move. Uh, but in any case, on a rocket like that, top of the milk stool, et cetera, they could see it actually vibrating and knew that the winds were up there. But they don't have an anemometer on board the spacecraft, so they didn't know exactly what the winds were. Talked to the ground control, and there were a lot of discussions about the wind. But in the end, essentially, the ground control people in Wally waived that rule and said, you know, kind of that go fever attitude that eventually does bite us in the rear end on Challenger. So, but in any case, luckily nothing happened. So there was no pad abort. The spaceship does lift off, obviously, here, gets past the tower, et cetera, et cetera, and goes on its way to, or to low Earth orbit. Here's just a few liftoff shots. I love some of the pictures of Apollo 7 taking off. Here's a shot looking, you know, when, remember I said it was done at the, at the Air Force Station out there. So here's all the launch complexes looking down, toward, looking down towards Launch Complex 34. I love this shot. They had a plane flying. So and actually captured the spacecraft lifting off with the vehicle assembly building that was going to be used for the Saturn V in the background. Great shot. Great shot. Here's another one, just a different angle, same, same idea. This one showing Launch Complex 34, the block house right here. OK, uh, now we're headed towards orbit. We get into low Earth orbit, an elliptical orbit that, uh, that the spacecraft eventually gets up into. And they start all of their testing. Um, once again, it's a shakedown cruise for the command and service module. So that's what they're going to be testing for the next 10 or 11 days. It was kind of one of those things that as long as everything checked out as the mission went along, the mission duration extended. You know, So as long as this passed, you were good to go to stay out longer and longer and longer up to that, uh, the, that essentially just about 10 to 11 days. Um, right in there for the entire mission duration. Originally, it was scheduled for 14 days, but they compressed it down. So one of the things that they were going to do was some rendezvous testing, maneuvering back and rendezvousing with this stage right here, the S4 stage. Why? Because eventually, this was going to be holding where the lunar module was. And so the command and service module was going to need to come around, point into there, and grab the lunar module out of here. But you'll notice. One of these things is not like the others, using the old Sesame Street tune. Okay, this one right here. Okay, those those covers that would that that, that went onto there were supposed to open up and, and rotate out. Wh whoops, excuse me. One, two, three came out just fine. Number four didn't didn't come out all the way. So they did the maneuvers. They came in, but they didn't get as close as they were originally planning on. That's a docking target right there. In fact, actually, I think I have another, yeah, another view right here. So um, a docking target for them to come in, and that's what they would utilize. There's a docking target attached to the lunar module so that you'd come in, and you're looking through the window at the docking target. You're not looking actually exactly where the, where the uh, two tunnels are that are going to, and the docking um, adapters are, um, but you're looking at the target and making sure you're lined up and come in, and boom. As long as you stay on that target, 
the two, uh, the docking mechanism, the male and female ends of that should line up just exactly correctly. So they didn't actually do that test, and because of this, on all the subsequent flights, that shroud, those four shroud mechanisms right there, they were redesigned such that they didn't have, you know, that they were, didn't just kind of come, come out like this, that they actually blew off during the flight. So that was one of the, the, one of the reasons for that, is that because if this happened, they were looking at it going, hmm, could the spacecraft get in there and get back out without damaging the lunar module or the command module? You know, not exactly sure. And that was the fear. And this had happened once before uh, on one of the Gemini missions. And that you heard it in that time, it was described as the angry alligator because of the way it looked, you know, with the, with the shrouds. So in any case, the other big thing that they were testing right here was the service propulsion system engine. They lit this thing off eight times, running it every, everywhere from a couple of seconds to just about a minute. Um, in duration, testing uh, whether the engine would continuously relight um, uh, during all of the uh, uh, all of the burns, um, and uh, whether you know just how much thrust it gave. Did it meet the same requirements as design, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, it worked extremely well. Um, no real problems with it. The first time they lit it off, they didn't expect. And they, they, they weren't prepared, I guess is really what I should say, for as much thrust as it gave them. So uh, it was a real kick in the pants. Yeah, that was kind of the way it was described. In fact, Wally Shiraz comment when they lit it off the first time, if you've ever watched the Flintstone, he said, yabba dabba do, because it shoved them all back into their seats. So. It's hypergolic, right? Or no, that one was off the service. Yeah. Make some. Oh yeah, bad stuff. Yeah, but the minute you mixed them together, no matter what, they were gonna light off. So that's all it took. No, no, two liquids, two liquids. You but the minute you mix them together, they're burning. So doesn't need doesn't need oxygen. It's got it in itself. So, but toxic as all get out. Bad stuff. So in any case, the and then. You had the tests of everything inside the ship. You, and here you're testing everything from food, you know, to, to navigation systems, um, to, you know, the, the electrical systems, the hydro, you know. They were running a complete shakedown of the ship. So there was a, an incredible amount of tests that they needed to do <coughs> during the mission. So here you got Walt Cunningham uh, work, working, Don Isley. I just have, or excuse me, Walt Cunningham again, sorry. Wally. So um, the, the windows um, was one of the things they discovered. The seals on the windows didn't work as well as expected. And so that some of them fogged up a bit um, during the mission. So they made some changes to them um, for later missions uh, on the seals. Uh, this is looking over the gulf um, uh, during the mission. As I said, they were just testing out. This was a whole different line of food that they were eating up in space. Um, uh, everything from cheese sandwiches, they took up fruit cocktail, cinnamon toast, cocoa chicken, uh, gingerbread, at apricot, cereal, etc. Uh, it was described as um, uh, too plentiful and too sweet. There was just, there was just so much. The crew kind of, that was their feedback um, after the mission. Uh, and so, you know, once again, changes were made mission to mission to mission, even as something like this. But they were able to have hot food for the first time and something that wasn't essentially squeezed out of a tube. So, uh, and you see my little note down here, but no coffee? No, they had coffee on the flight, but originally they weren't supposed to. Coffee was not on the manifest. Wally sure was a Navy guy. This was not sitting well, argued it. And the way he got his point across about that that needed to be on the, on the, man, on the, on the food manifest, shall we say, uh, was they were having a senior echelon meeting and they were, you know, they'd gone through the morning's portion of the meeting and the, they were on a break. And so the, the, the snacks cart came in, no coffee on it. And basically he says, hey, you guys want, you know, you say we can't have coffee in space. You're going to have to deal without coffee for a day. He made his point. Coffee went back on the menu. <laughs> so, so, yeah, kind of that well played kind of thing. So. One of the other things that was occurring for the first time um, uh, was <coughs> uh, television. 
let me step back for a moment. Apollo 7 is a mission that, you know, the, the, there are certain ones that you remember in the Apollo program. Apollo 11, obviously. Most everybody remembers. If you were alive at the time, you remember where you were, what was going on, sometimes during the launch, but at least always when Neil Armstrong stepped foot onto the moon, you kind of remember where you were. Okay, Apollo 8, first time we flew to the moon, you know, so flew people to the moon. You remember, you know, the different missions, last, you know, Apollo 17, et cetera. When we walked on the moon, each of those missions kind of big. And th there's some of the Apollo missions that kind of just disappear somewhat down, down into, you know, Apollo 10, dress rehearsal for Apollo 11. They did everything up to actually landing on the moon. They got down there, but they didn't actually take the spacecraft all the way down. So Apollo 9 was the first test of the lunar module, but also kind of tends to get a little bit forgotten. That was probably one of the biggest test um, flights of the, uh, of the program heading up to to Apollo 11, so, um, but in Apollo 7, you know, it was the first flight of Apollo, made some big headlines at the time, but kind of tends to be forgotten, and sometimes also is looked back on that there were problems with the mission. The mission executed everything that it was supposed to. All of the, all of the test requirements for the mission all got executed, absolutely everything, but there were issues on the mission. One of the biggest was there was some conflict between ground control, mission control, and the engineers and test people and the crew up in space. Many different reasons for this one. Some of it had to do with kind of go back. Remember, Wally Shira, Apollo 1, you have the loss of the crew. Wally comes in and becomes very adamant about, you know, we are going to focus, focus, focus on what is going on on this one and, and didn't want any ex anything extraneous. Kind of think TV broadcasts from space are a little extraneous. Yeah, to a point. We can see, the, can see the, the benefit of it, but it was one of those things that he saw kind of as, a, as something that was totally extraneous. Also, they wanted to keep crowding the flight plan with test after test after test. Changes, changes, and so he pushed back on a lot of that. So there was some of that going on, but then add on top of it, they get up into space on day one while he develops a head cold. Now, Head cold here on Earth is unpleasant. We've all had one, okay? You don't like it. You know, you get stuffed up, your ears clog, you drain, you're blowing, you don't feel good in your throat. It's just unpleasant. It's magnified in space because when you get up into space, remember, you've got this circulatory system here that's used to working in gravity and pushing fluids from down there back up to here. In space, no gravity. Well, microgravity. You know, so, but, and there is gravity, yes, I realize, but because you're in orbit, you feel weightless, okay? In any case, all of that pressure that your body's normally used to of pushing everything from up there to up here, now doesn't have very much resistance because there's nothing pulling it back down towards that center of the earth. So all of a sudden, all this fluids, everything zoom, rushes up to your head and gives you a full feeling to begin with. In fact, you get kind of puffy head. Out, you know, up in, up, in, up in space until the body kind of starts to, to relax back. But it's still, it's still those fluids are up here. So you got that going on to begin with. So you already feel a little puffed up and congested. Now you add on top of it this, and it doesn't drain. Once again, no gravity to drain. So now it just kind of sits there. That can make you unpleasant. So uh, Walt Cunningham didn't get really sick. Don Isley got a little sick. Wally got sick So uh, on, on the mission. Mission commander, sick, unpleasant, kind of rubs off on the crew a little bit as well. So, you know, Don Isley a little bit more than Walt Cunningham. Um, Walt tended to be a little bit more of a peacemaker. But the relationships between the crew and ground control weren't exactly great, um, especially when things were changed or you got to things that he didn't want to deal with in the first place, like the TV broadcast. There were some very terse discussions that went down. Normally it was that you had a Capcom. Capsule communicator, who was a fellow astronaut, who talked to the crew. Okay? There were times on this mission where you had to have people other than the Capcom get on the line with the crew to try and talk to them, specifically Wally, about you know, issues and things like that. So uh, yeah, very unpleasant. They ended up taking you know, headache medicine, uh, Actifed. That'll come back to play here a little bit, because you know, so, they were carrying that on the, on the space capsule. But it really didn't help a whole lot. Um, especially in those initial phases where uh, Wally, to a point, was you know just had to be laying down on his couch and overseeing the testing and everything else like that. Yes. This 1968. So, 
In any case, though, as I said, eventually there was a little hiccup with getting the TV broadcasts going, but on October 15th, we had our first live broadcast from space. So, and the crew ahead of time, right now, I, once again, Wally was kind of not happy about doing the television broadcasts, but when the camera clicked on, he became the consummate performance artist. So, and the Wally Walton Don Show began. So they did a number of broadcasts every morning um, where they did. They had cue cards to hold up, and the mission control folks would read them because, you know, you can see it wasn't exactly the clear broadcast, you know, 1968 television from outer space. Keep those cards and letters coming in, folks. Here you've got from the lovely Apollo room high atop everything <laughs> that they held up. So, and they showed what was, you know, they showed the inside of the spacecraft. They showed eating, drinking, floating. You know, things that people really hadn't seen before. Yes, there had been TV from space before, um, but it was not broadcast live. It was just kind of recorded, um, some stuff recorded. But here you're, you're having live broadcasts, uh, very popular, so well watched um, as it went on. Here you got the crew, you know, in front, of the, uh, uh, in front of the main control panel there in the command module. And as the sun sinks slowly in the west, you know, so ending one of the broadcasts. But they had these cue cards that they took up with them. Okay, here's one of them. It says, Paul Haney, are you a turtle? Okay, so, uh, jokes. We'll go back to the jokes. So, one of the things that had existed for a while was this, the, the Turtle Society, the International Society of Turtles. Uh, and this had been going on back and forth between ground, ground control, mission control, and the spacecraft for a while. There had been questions that had gone back and forth where over, over live broadcasts, people had asked, are you a turtle? And if you were inducted into this society of the turtles, if somebody asked you if you're a turtle, there is a specific answer. Somebody other than Dave, do you know what the answer is? And if you have sensitive ears, please cover them up, but it's really not that bad in today's world. Anybody know what the answer is? You're close. You bet your sweet ass I am, because every turtle owns a jackass. There's, there's a lot of joking and stuff, and if you want a little bit more, there's, there's a whole series of questions that you're supposed to, that are, that are riddles that anybody in the Turtle Society is supposed to be able to answer, um, and it gets a little off color, but the answers are not off color. The questions are. So in any case, if you want to hear them, come up and talk to me afterward. So, yes, exactly. If you're a turtle, yes, you have a clean mind and soul, so when this question gets asked that can seem like it's off color, the answer is totally not off color. It's totally logical. So in any case, though, but you're supposed to say, you bet your sweet ass I am. But this being 1968, NASA live broadcasts, the, the, it was, nobody was going to say that over the air. You know, nobody was going to say that. So um, uh, Deke Slayton had been asked, are you a turtle? Deke Slayton grabbed up one of the recorders and recorded his answer so that it could be heard later. So he did answer it. So, but Paul Haney, who was the voice of Mission Control, Public affairs for mission control. And oh, by the way, retired here in New Mexico, died in this area um, uh, as, as well. Uh, in any case, he had known the astronauts for forever. So one of the cue cards that they held up for him was, Paul Haney, are you a turtle? This is the actual cue card that you're seeing there. So that was, that was being held up. In fact, actually one of the other cue cards, and here's one of the other ones. And in New Jersey, the number to call is Bigelow 8. So in any case, these are up here for you to, for you to take a look at uh, after you finish. They're on loan to us from uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of friends of the museum from Boston, uh, David Meerman Scott and uh, Larry McGlynn. Uh, so in any case, uh, feel free to come up and take a look at that. But they asked Paul Haney, are you a turtle? And then after a while, they kept asking, well, what was Haney's answer? Because they hadn't heard anything. And everybody just, the, the Capcom kept coming back saying, Paul Haney's being really quiet, and yeah, he's just going to buy. So, because you're supposed to buy a drink for everybody in hearing. Does that include everybody on TV who's listening in <laughs> at this point in time? But so Paul Haney just surrendered and you know, figured he would just buy for, buy for everybody in Mission Control. So, because he never did answer it, he just kind of sat there. <laughs> so. There he is, actually, with the, uh, uh, with the placard. Okay, um, continuing on with the mission as we're, as we're kind of coming to our conclusion here. 
they're getting ready to go in for re-entry. Remember, uh, Wally had had a head cold. Uh, he'd, had to, he'd been blowing his nose like crazy. They said it was like a used tissue box on the inside of the spacecraft because there were used tissues <laughs> everywhere. Um, and as, they, as, as Walt Cunningham said later, he's like, good thing we overpacked on the, on the, t on the uh, wipes for the mission. So, because he was just like, blow, blow, you know. And, and the problem there was is that when you blow, it would increase the pressure in your head. Trying to clear, you know, that Valsalva thing where you pinch your nose and try and equalize pressure. That's what he was having to do a lot, blow his nose and do that. Well, if you put this helmet back on, you can't do that anymore. Extremely concerned. So he said, we're not going to wear the helmets coming back in for landing. Um, uh, you know, put on the suits, but we're not going to wear the helmets. Mission control was, no, you're going to wear the helmets. You know, um, Deke Slayton gets on the line, the head of the astronaut office, pushes it. You know, you're going to wear the And Wally, Wally just refuses. You can read the transcripts on it. You know, he says, we're not going to do it. And they ended up just kind of cushioning their heads on the thing and not wearing that. Remember, Don Isley was also a little stuffed up. Walt Cunningham's not so much. Uh, but in any case, so none of the three of them uh, wore their helmets during reentry because they were afraid that because they couldn't, you know, clear their heads, that they'd blow out their eardrums, you know, because of the la inability to equalize on the pressure. So in any case, that was yet another instance of the crew refusing to obey orders. Um, Deke Slayton described it after afterwards as he, you know, just basically told him, you know, screw you, I'm not doing it, you know, so. And then the spacecraft landed in the ocean. Remember, a couple of, uh, couple of kilometers away from the, uh, from the Essex, upside down. That had to feel good <laughs> with a head cold hanging upside down. But these, you know, you can see these balloons right here. They inflated almost immediately, <laughs> righted the spacecraft so that the antennas could, could get them. So and here they are recovering. There's a misnomer amongst a lot of people that the helicopters come in and lift the spacecraft away. No. OK. Yes, earlier. No for Apollo, too heavy. So the helicopters came in and recovered. There you see the basket lifting up one of the crew members. And then the ship came alongside and lifted the spacecraft onto the ship, onto the ship, ship. In any case, here's our crew arriving on board the ship, looking 11 days later, you know, with all the whole beard thing going on. Essex says hello. There they've gotten themselves cleaned up, getting ready to head back in. Later on, they end up going on various assorted tours a little bit. So here you see them with the crew of Apollo 8 um, uh, as well, kind of uh, off for uh, uh, events here with the President Johnson in the background. End up on Bob Hope's variety show with Barbara Eden. So. And eventually, Wally, those of us who lived in the 1980s, saw these commercials. So Wally ends up becoming a spokesman for Actifed. That stuff he took while he was, while he was off in space. So you've got him, here we go, specified most by doctors, 1973 through 1982. This, and it's great. If you go and watch the commercials, and this, is a, this was a, uh, a 1985 uh, uh, magazine ad. Um, if you go and watch the commercials, and you can see them on YouTube if you want to. You know, he's floating around inside of a space shuttle capsule. It's kind of funny. Uh, or a space shuttle cockpit, you know. So as he's doing this, and, and really bad fake floating in space effects um, uh, as, he's ta as he's talking about it. And eventually, you also, <laughs> Actifed also gets taken on Apollo 12 by the crew members on board there. So you got Al Bean and Dick Gordon here as well. Um, uh, they're, all, they're all joining together and, and hawking at Actifed. So you know, kind of just one of those fallout things. By the way, none of the three astronauts ever fly again. Um, Wally, because he was planning on retiring, and had already announced it before the mission, um, so he does not fly again. Uh, Walt Cunningham and Don Isley don't fly again, eventually end up retiring from NASA, although they work in other program offices for a period of time uh, in the community. Chris Kraft, who is in charge of mission control, um, and you can read it in his book or whatever, said basically none, they're never flying again. Too much conflict between mission control and the, the ground personnel and the folks up in space. Walt Cunningham, not so much. He, he, he thought that maybe Walt would live in purgatory for a little while, and then he would fly again. Don Isley, nope. And Wally, definitely not. But Wally was going to be retiring anyways. And uh, um, Deke Slayton pretty much just fell in line with Chris Kraft and, and backed him up on that one. 
And in fact, actually, when you take a look at the awards um, after the mission, um, this crew was given the Ex Exceptional Service Medal after that, uh, after that mission. Every other Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo flight, they'd gotten the Distinguished Service Medal after the flight. This crew got the Exceptional Service Medal. That was corrected in 2008 by NASA, who went back and said, okay, yeah, we were a little uh, wrong <laughs> on that one. Corrected the error and awarded the three of them, posthumously for two of them, um, the uh, Distinguished Service Medal. So uh, in any case, um, just I'll finish up with two things. One, it's that weekend. So I got to put that up. Two of the guys who were on this flight were Naval Academy graduates. Fellow Naval Academy graduates, so uh, so I got to put that up, and uh, and then the thing that I always finish with is yeah okay I always have to put that one up. Um, uh, <laughs> so in addition, Wally Shira, um, I've had the pleasure of meeting Walt Cunningham and Wally Shira. Never met Don Isley. Um, Walt Cunningham, really nice individual, um, a consummate professional, um, great speaker. Um, Wally Shira, met him at a uh, uh, at a meeting in San Diego. Uh, I was, I was new, the first museum that I took over, he was um, going to be, or he was going to be the speaker at the San Diego Air and Space Museum for a Naval, uh, National Air and Space Museum Mutual Concerns Conference. And so show up at the, uh, the event venue, the, the Air and Space Museum, and the guy who was the vice president of the museum, myself, walking around a corner, he, we see Wally there. Uh, I had not met him yet. Um, uh, my, uh, the vice president had. So he went ahead and said, hey, let me introduce you to Wally. So we waited. He was talking to somebody else. He turns. He sees the guy who's my vice president. He's like, hey, Jim, great to see you, et cetera. So, and Jim starts to introduce me <laughs> to him. Wally looks at me. Now, I was a submariner in the Navy. He had known about me. Navy, uh, Wally was a naval aviator. Um, uh, but he heard my name. He knew that I took over. Wally had a great relationship with the Cosmosphere, the museum that I that I come from. He looks at me and says, oh, you're that new submariner at the Cosmosphere. Now, submariner is the way the British pronounce, pronounce it. We in America think that's a, a, a little bit of a derogatory comment. And Wally, being a naval aviator, definitely knows that. So he's obviously taking one of his digs at me. So he says that. And I just look at him for a second. I says, oh, and you're that old nasal radiator I've heard about from San Diego. We spent the whole evening together jibing at each other, sitting over dinner, et cetera, et cetera. And then he gets up on stage and starts jibing me from the, and I couldn't say anything back then. So absolutely hilarious, really funny individual. And once again, just a total gentleman and really, really, really nice guy. So uh, in any case, though, just had the pleasure of meeting him. So there we have finished with six minutes to go before uh, 10 o'clock. Do you have any questions? I'll hold you. Oh, wait, go, go ahead, Dave. Yep. Because, by the way, everything checks out on Apollo 7, and it confirms NASA good decision to then send Apollo 8 to the moon with the command and service module, no lunar module, um, on its way and on its way back. They had to confirm that everything would work well with Apollo 7 before they really could send Apollo 8 on its way to the moon. Yes, sir. Essentially, you can get moisture forming up in the in the overheads in the vehicle assembly building. So, because it is so large, so not at all. Oh, it's a huge, absolutely monstrous building. And the first time you get in there and start taking a look around, you're, it's you know it's 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 pretty impressive to say the least. Yes, sir. Yes. Not always, so, but you do have instances of it like uh, the Apollo 12 crew coming back, uh, and they were all, they were all commanders uh, in the Navy, 
and they came back and while they were in the quarantine trailer um, they were talking with the president and the president conferred the rank of captain upon upon all three so but it didn't happen all the time no Apollo 12 that was Conrad Bean and Gordon so any other questions hearing none um, let's see um, other events that we have coming up it is the first weekend in October so tomorrow is our Trinity site uh, tour do we have any seats left on the bus or are we full up yeah we got a couple of seats left on the bus so if you've never been at the Trinity site and you want to do it in comfort um, uh, with uh, historians talking to you videos watching on the way back a bathroom on the bus great thing to have heading out to the Trinity site so uh, there's still seats available for that one uh, next month's lecture is being given by Mike Shinneberry, who was here earlier. He's still, oh, there he is. So uh, in any case, back there. Uh, and it's going to be about science fiction and science fact and the relationship um, between those. Kathy, what else do we want to uh, announce? Uh, our first Oh, yeah. Work off that donut. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming, as always, to the Launchpad Lecture Series. So we hope to see you again next month and in the months after that. And as always, keep your eyes open for what we've got event-wise. Check up on us on Facebook. Become a member, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much for coming today. Oh, and if you want to see the artifacts, you can come on up here. <laughs>